What exactly is the GRID method and how can you use it or HyperDocs in your social studies classroom? We'll talk about that in today's video. Hello and welcome to episode five of We Teach History, the weekly show here at the Mr. and Mrs. Social Studies YouTube channel designed to help social studies teachers and provide new guidance and tips. Today we're talking about the grid method. Now I have talked about the grid method on the channel in the past. I specifically used it when I also taught Spanish in the past. However, I wanted to take you into a closer look of the grid method today with a social studies focus. And I actually will get on my computer to create one with you for the sake of this video so you have additional clarity. Now, one thing I love about the grid method is that it really helps me differentiate in a way that seems very doable. And if you've got technology, I think this can really be a benefit to your class. The premise is that students are working through different grids, which personally I set up in Google Docs, and it was essentially a hyperdoc, meaning that on that main document, there were several links going to various different activities and resources and videos. So students were able to move from one portion of the document to the other, gradually increasing their skills. The idea is that the students go through their material at their own pace, and students can spend more or less time, depending on their needs, on each section. There are materials that allow students to go back and practice over and over again for certain content if they need, as well as enrichment sections to help students who don't necessarily find the material challenging push their thinking and improve. One of the things I love most about it is that it takes you away from that lecturing mindset or the 100% direct instruction mindset, and it allows you to connect more one-on-one -on -one with students and support those who are really struggling, while the students who aren't struggling are able to move ahead at their own pace and go above and beyond like they would want to, and it prevents boredom from that way. I actually mentioned this a little bit in my lecture alternative video. I will link that below if you haven't already seen that. Now I'm going to shift into the computer part where I record a sample version that you can incorporate in your own classroom. Hello, I am now here on a dock and we are going to build several types of grids here together so you can see the process of how to do it. Obviously I'm just on a blank dock because we'll be building this. Personally, I do prefer to use docs when I'm building these grids or hyperdocs. And we'll go through the grid method, which I actually have a completed one I'll show you. And then I will go through the process of setting these other ones up. And one thing that would be very helpful for anyone who's watching that I forgot to include in the initial part I filmed, I'm curious what grade level and subject you teach if you're a viewer of mine, just because I want to make sure the videos that I create are as aligned as possible to what you are teaching. And I am not too sure of what people are teaching. I assume it's largely social studies teachers, but I could be wrong. I assume there's definitely like middle school or high school teachers, but again, I could be wrong. So please let me know grade level and subject in the comments. That would be so incredibly helpful. For this, let me just show you first the example of the official grid method. Now this was for Spanish and it was a Google Doc. Currently it is a Word Doc just because I, when I stopped working at that school, I backed up all of my files and downloaded them since the Google account got shut down. Basically, most things are going to be linked. A hyperdoc implies that you've got lots of different documents or related Google Drive files or other online links linked to that main page. Now, over time, I continued to improve the setup. I'll actually be walking you through. This is the first grid I had created, and then I'll show you the last grid that I created just so you can see the differences. I started out with a link to an expectations document. I put a calendar here as well as kind of the codes of the suggested thing that students were working on. I put some final dates to take assessments as well as the number of points for the grid. So this was Spanish, but students started with vocabulary, which for social studies is also something that would often be used. So I actually put together a video overview of the vocab, kind of flipped classroom style, although pretty basic. The same kind of thing could work if you have vocab for 
your particular history topic, you could put together a slideshow, a Google slideshow of that vocabulary. The illustrated review was a worksheet students did to help practice the vocab word and they would do an illustration of it and like an example. There was a selection of forms here to help them practice the words. So I had two Google Forms. I can't actually click on these because the form itself, will the link is no longer active because the forms were shut down. I have backups of the forms, but I had a picture matching vocab activity as well as a vocab, I think just multiple choice activity on Google Forms. And those are opportunities for the students to practice the vocab. So they get exposure to the new vocab in part A then in part B, they're actually going through the process of practicing it. Quizlet also is an amazing tool. Not only are there a lot of different games students can play on Quizlet that are, I think, more engaging and do different types of things with the vocab words, but you can also do Quizlet live with the whole group. So that was an easy review. I didn't have to like create a Kahoot or create something else. I could just use the Quizlet live that I already had the Quizlet for in the grid. When students felt comfortable, then they would actually take the assessment. And I personally invested in the pro version of Socrative. I found that to be a really amazing tool for students to be able to take the quizzes whenever they wanted or whenever they felt ready for them, but they were password protected, which I think hopefully helped cut down on potential cheating just because I would give, I mean, the passwords weren't anything crazy. So if a kid wanted to be very sneaky, I'm sure they could have pulled it off. But the idea it was that I would give them the code that they needed for that quiz and then they would take it. There was a second set of vocab, which for social studies, you probably wouldn't have two sets of vocab. But I suppose you could set up if you were following the structure of a textbook, and I'm just trying to give you lots of ideas here, you could have a little grid like this or a little row like this for each section of the textbook. So just kind of start thinking about it um, a little bit that way. We also have the grammar section. Now there's a lot more going on here just because grammar tended to be more difficult as well as in social studies, the vocab tends to be easier. Sometimes there's additional details that make it more difficult. So what I did, I had notes here, slideshow, and I had paper copies of a note sheet that went along with a slideshow. I find students vary in terms of how they like to do notes. Some of them, they want to go through and write it out, follow along with the slideshow. Some of them prefer to watch a video of the teacher explaining it. So I actually put together a video going through the slideshow and explaining it, which is basically the same kind of text that I would have given to the students if I was having that be the whole day of class and I was lecturing. There's also practice activities. With history, it might be tougher. Not all of the subjects might have like a good practice activity, but again, you could incorporate a Google form that kind of reviews. It could be some multiple choice questions or some matching questions, maybe chronology, putting things in order that connects to what was in the slideshow to help students apply it. Same thing here. And then after just to assess what kids had done, there would be a Socrative quiz. These were pretty short little quizzes, but just nice checks for review. What's really nice is that this can all be self-paced. So that's one of the best parts about this. You've got the grid, it's a pain to make. I, I never enjoyed the process of making them since it usually required one or two like full days of work. Um, not, not during the school day, but like over a weekend or in the evening to put them together quite a few hours. However, once it was all together, this was basically my, my unit was kind of planned and I didn't really have to do anything besides just show up and be there and help my students out. But then like in this case, this four week time period, I didn't have any lesson planning. And also grading is really nice too, because first of all, you're not grading any of the practice activities because the intention is practice. And if a student doesn't need the practice, they already know it, then they don't need to waste their time on assignments that are 
helping them enforce what they already know so they can move faster. And if a student is struggling, they can take a lot more time and do the practice activities multiple times and go back and watch the video if they didn't get it the first time. You still do have to have some deadlines in place, but overall I think it can work really nicely. I had a final spot for the test and the travel slide project that students would work on ongoing throughout the year. And there was also an enrichment spot here. That was my first grid I made. This is the one I ended the year with to just show that kind of how it changed and how I organized it differently. I ended up putting the vocab together just for convenience. And then for assessments, I put the test and then the projects. I think this could be a cool thing to do for social studies, assuming that you do tests as well as different projects especially if the projects can be more self-paced or taught at different times. I was always focused on more project-based activities rather than tests just because, and this will be a different video topic, but the way that many schools assess is very outdated and tests I think can be pretty outdated as well. So definitely understandable. You may have to just keep doing tests at the moment because that's what your school district expects from you and there's policies written in about that, but definitely having the project-based elements is really positive. And my calendars changed as well. I really liked having calendars set up just so students knew what was coming up. And again, these were a pain to create, but after they were created, it was very easy. Everyone was on the same page and it just meant that my time in class was freed up so I could work more one-on-one -on -one with students and actually have more interaction with them rather than simply lecturing or doing whole class activities the whole time. Of course, I could still do that if I needed to. For instance, some things were marked here orange that were whole class activities, but in general, a lot of it was more so independent work time and I would mark when there was an assignment due, all of that. Now going back to these topics here, we've talked about the grid method. We've sort of talked about the flipped classroom model, but let me just do some grids. I am a fan of the basic chart. I don't know what it is. I just really like using charts. And obviously you can customize these as much as you want. But let's say we've got, a, or I guess a table here. Let's say you're doing flipped classroom. There's definitely a lot of ways that you could go about it. An easy example that could work for the flipped classroom or the calendar would be to set up the days of the week. So if you were setting up, let me actually zoom in on this so you can see it a little better. This is just a very hypothetical example if you were trying to set up a flipped classroom approach. I also want to specify too that the cool thing is that you can definitely try these out without feeling that you have to commit to it like the entire school year. We definitely want to test things before we implement them at scale. So for instance, if you are curious to see how the concept of a flipped classroom would work for your class or your students, try it for a week or try it for two weeks or a month even to see what you think and then be able to make an informed decision. Here would be a really simple way. This is again just on a Google Doc. I went ahead and I plugged in the dates here for the week. And I have a section that's before class and a section that's during class. And with this section here, kind of the premise is when you have a flipped classroom, you want sort of the passive, more obvious parts for students to do kind of instead of homework. And then the homework where they're actually working through the problems or challenges, activities that could be more difficult, that happens during class. So a great example would be in social studies, let's say you were lecturing about something. Rather than spend class time lecturing, or like if maybe the kids were reading something, that's what they do outside of class. And then during class, they can focus on applying that information in a certain activity. Let's say you're teaching about ancient Egypt, since that's what I'm gonna be working on some curriculum coming up here um, this weekend. Maybe you're teaching about the geography of ancient Egypt and Normally, you would do a lecture about geography of ancient Egypt. Instead, maybe you'd consider providing a video of yourself explaining that. Use your same slideshow, record it, upload it to YouTube as an unlisted video or teacher tube or one of those types of websites, and then students can watch it from there. 
Rather than saying, I'm in a lecture during class and giving them a homework assignment, you could instead have them work on the activity during class and just the premise is that they should have watched the video before they were in class. Of course, there are other issues and debates that come up with the flipped classroom approach, but this is at least how you could set up a grid for it. Another approach could be just a more generic calendar. Obviously with a flipped classroom model, we have some elements of a calendar there, but you could just make it more of a generic calendar. This one's just three weeks, so maybe you were having a three week unit. And again, it can be helpful to kind of give kids a heads up if you are planning a little bit more advanced. I am a huge proponent of planning out your whole unit before you actually start teaching it, just because then you can have the end in mind. But when we take a look at this, I also want to show you how you can add an actual like link in there just in case you haven't done it before. You could plug in your days and then you could, you know, decide what you want there. So let's say I've got vocabulary. I'm typing one handed while I hold the microphone. Usually it's a little faster than that. So maybe you've got vocabulary. Maybe it's a slideshow, a video uh, that you put together based on a slideshow, a Quizlet link, whatever it is. You would highlight that text and then you can go to insert link and then you would paste whatever your link is there. So for instance, I don't actually remember what that is, but you could include a link there, click apply. And then now when students view this, obviously you have editing access, but when you post this doc on Google Classroom, the kids can go to it, they can click on that link and it will take them to that particular link. So that's just an example of how you can incorporate the links there and you can do it in calendar form when it makes sense. And again, this isn't something you have to do every day all the time. In little increments, it can be really helpful. Next up, early finishers. An early finishers doc can be very basic, but also very convenient. I know in the past I've done a video talking about my early finishers board that I had. I will link that video below if you're curious. It was just a bulletin board display I had in my room. Think about how many options you have and I would just include that many columns or sections in the table. So let's just say that you've got three different things that kids could do when they're done. So one really great example that both, especially Jake, who's the Mr. Social Studies on the channel, uses with his students is CNN 10. It's a really great option to show student news. It's a new episode every day. It is a wonderful resource. And I actually used it at my first school. Um, that was something we did every day, like during an advisory or end of the day type of time. But you could have the link to that. So CNN 10. So on the CNN 10 site, I could just copy the URL. It is just 10 minutes, so it's nice if you've got like that awkward 10 minutes left at the end of a lesson as well. And then you go back to your grid, so I could include the link there. I could just do it like this, or if I wanted to, I could hyperlink the actual text. Again, there's no rules when doing this. You do what you want. So, I mean, I wouldn't usually link both, but that was just to show you the examples. Okay. Another option would be to include if there's relevant educational games, because the honest truth is that kids love games and you can have additional activities, but, but if we're being real, students don't always want to do an extra activity it's, if it seems like more work. So finding educational games that you like. As far as a few of my favorites, iCivics is amazing and there's lots of games on there. They're genuinely very good. The students don't think they're going to like it and then they love it and they want to keep playing the game over and over again. Also, geography related games, GeoGuessr is really cool. It's just spelled without an E there. So finding similar games that are related, sometimes there are individual games that work with a lesson. For instance, when I taught the Oregon Trail to students in Westward Expansion, if they had extra time, I would let them play. There was a free online version, I think from like the 90s version of Oregon Trail. And that would be something that's really fun. Finding those particular activities that pertain to your subject area, putting those there that are genuinely fun is a great option. I guess also related to maybe you had, maybe the section is news. Maybe your school subscribes to Newzella or News ELA. 
they've got many great articles as well as the fact that they're you can level them is an amazing option. So you could have that. You could put activities in. Maybe this is an extra credit opportunity. Students can do an enrichment opportunity to go above and beyond the material. So again, it's really going to depend on your unit, but you could have the details listed there. And that's an example of early finishers. And this could be something easy to keep on your official Google Classroom page or if you are using another format of the grid, such as calendar or flip classroom, you could incorporate at that on the document. And then it prevents that moment of, what do we do now? Of course though, if you don't have regular computer access, obviously this is not the ideal option. Lastly, a lesson introduction. If you want to introduce something for the first time, kind of like I had on kind of like I showed you on the grids earlier on, I have things marked step one, step two, step three, step four. I find that really helps students to go step by step because they know, okay, I have to do step one before I move on to step two. And so when doing a lesson introduction or even like a web quest, if you wanted to design a web quest, which I mean, there's so much variation there, to just kind of think what would be the steps you'd want students to do. And you could, set up a very similar situation to what we've done up here, have maybe you have step one, step two, step three, and you figure out, okay, if I'm just introducing a lesson to students, what might I want them to do? Perhaps there's a video that gives a good introduction, or you're trying to have them fill out a Google form just to see what their thoughts are before they're doing an activity. Maybe they're doing a short reading from a Newzella article or primary source or from their textbook and they're doing a quick formative assessment on a Google form to be able to just kind of assess what they learned from doing that reading. So you can definitely do individual lessons in grid format that allows the kids to go step by step. Again, just like I showed you right here and you could have them all in the same row, however you decide to do it. But I hope that helps give some ideas about how you can use HyperDocs and grids. They're pretty simple in terms of structure to set up. The timing, it's time consuming to get it all together, but I think it can be a really cool element of something to apply to your class. That wraps up my overview of the grid method. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know any questions you have. And if you're curious, check out some of our past videos here. We'll see you next time. Bye.